Hello everyone, welcome to Bios and Bookmarks, powered by the NGC Bocas Lit Fest. I'm Shivani Ramluchan, and this is our season finale of season five, which has been all about telling complex family stories. I'm really, really happy to be joined by Lauren Scott, who is no stranger to Bocas Lit Fest family. Lawrence, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Lawrence is here to talk with us and to read for us from his newest book, Dangerous Freedom, which is published by Papillot Press. And Dangerous Freedom recontextualizes for us the life of a very well-known historical personage who has perhaps been a bit too romanticized in recent tellings, and that is Dido Bell. So for those of you who are not familiar with Dido's story, or hopefully by the end of this episode, going to know a great deal more about her and about Lawrence's work. Lawrence, as most of you will know, is an award-winning Caribbean novelist and short story writer from Trinidad and Tobago. His first novel, Witch Broom, was a BBC book at bedtime, and his second novel, Ailred Sin, won the Commonwealth Writers' Prize Best Book for Canada and the Caribbean, in 1999. He's the winner of the Tom Gallon Trust Short Story Award. Light Falling on Bamboo received an honorable mention from Casa de las Americas Prize, Cuba, long listed for the International Impact Dublin Literary Award in 2014, shortlisted for the OCM Bogus Prize Fiction category. So Lawrence, I think without further ado, I will invite you to share your first reading from Dangerous Freedom with us. Thank you, Shivani. Thanks, and thank you very much for having me and, and Bocas for having me. I'm going to read a passage from a little way into the novel. Um, and Elizabeth Davinier, that is the married name of Dido Bell, is living in her home in Pimlico. She's no longer at Kenwood House. She's living with her three sons. Well, actually, two of the sons, because one of the boys died. And she is awaiting her two boys back from school at this point. Where were Lydia and the boys? Elizabeth sat among her roses and her mother's voice flooded the air and her mind. My children. She woke in a panic, crying out for them. Was it that tincture of laudanum again? It was getting dark. It was almost time for her husband to be back. She heard the front door slam. John Davinier, on arriving home, went out immediately again in order to search for Lydia and the two boys. There had been no word of where they were since Mrs. Halifax had come to the house that afternoon. She had come to say that Lydia had called in earlier with Billy. She had said she had to go looking for Charles, who had not met them at the appointed place in Belgravia after school. She had seemed alarmed. It was a summer's evening with two hours left of light. Sorry, um, my earphones are falling out. It was a summer's evening with two hours left of light. Elizabeth waited at home. Elizabeth told Mrs. Halifax that she preferred to be quietly at home, but she would come to her if she began to feel she could not cope on her own. The boys had been so eager to start this morning, with Billy going off to school as well, so excited to be accompanying his brother, Charles. How they had both grown over the summer, shooting up above the pencil marks, scratched on the wall of their bedroom, by the door where their heights had been recorded over the years. There was Johnny's, whose last measurement had been used 
for his small coffin. Elizabeth traced his height with her fingers. Where were they? What was Lydia up to going off with Billy on a wild search? Elizabeth was desperate. She had only the letters, her story, the summer evening with its high blue brightness, the orchestra of birds and the gulls from the river circling. This pleasure contradicted the time, filling her with the foreboding that she had been having for so long that her black boy would go missing. Would they steal her Billy as well? While she is at this point waiting, she is reading one of the letters that she has written to her mother many years ago and is awaiting her mother's reply. Dear Mammy, who else is there for me to tell? I not hear from you, so I not sure you're listening. But Mammy, I tell myself that this is where I talk to you, and this is where alone I feel you close when I think I talking to you just as I want to talk to you. I talking as my tongue feel easy as us on Mary Hill looking down on the river. You must not think I am a bad girl when I tell you these things. The other afternoon, I take a walk among the elms in a part of the wood beyond where the new dairy build. I get lost there. Something alarmed me. I was on my own when Molly find me. All I remembering now as I write to you is that I must stand brave. I stand and listen to the music of the strong wind rushing through the branches. It sounds like the waves breaking on the shore by the rocks where you must be living in your house in Pensacola. I want to be there with you. When Molly asks me who it is that she see running through the woods, I tell her that she make a mistake. No one in the woods but me. I lie. I did have to warn Hal at the dairy the following day that the next time he alarm me, I go have to report him. But I frightened to do that because I think they go think is me doing bad things. Hear what he asked me. And you is not the master little piece of pork? Easy pickings on the street, like the little negresses near Hoban? So why you refuse me? What is that you say? I ask. I call after him. Little nigger, he called me. It was then he run off into the woods, pulling up his breeches, when he see Molly coming to meet me under the elms. But I never tell her what I'll do me. I can't find words for that now, for his hand under my dress, for his fingers where they're poking inside of me between my legs, forcing himself, him all shivering and whimpering and me cold, cold. You must not think bad of me, mammy. Who I go tell? What I go do? Tell me, please. Tell me, please. Where are you? Send for me. Elizabeth let the letter drop to the floor. She was struck how she had written in her mother's grammar as a girl, hardly a girl then, needing her mother. needing her mother, finding solace in her grammar. To see her words so raw upon the page shocked her. It was not her now. She was not the person who was remembering so much. She, Mrs. Davigny, Elizabeth, Lizzie, with her garden, the fragrance of roses, forgetting so much, remembering so much, having to think of her own boys, then having to remember the world and what was happening to so many who were still transported. Instead, in that letter, she was that slave, Dido. What they named her and made of her for a time and captured in that portrait, framed with her basket of fruit and flowers, looking like a bell. The mix of the artist's pigments and applications of color may have been similar, but their ideas were quite different. What a mess it turned out to be. 
never hung, disappeared. Elizabeth remembered more of what had happened among the elms that day so long ago. She pinned down the chronology of Hal's wickedness. She was forced to recall the hedgerow where it had all begun as a girl of 14. She had lain terrified and dared not scream, but somehow managed to stop the fumbling boy, stop his business that first time. Wipe yourself, she remembered whispering. What she remembered most was the terror that lived with her each time she had to encounter him, which was every day when they were at Canewood, with her working in the dairy and the poultry, and then every day after when they moved from Bloomsbury, after the fire, to be at Canewood for always, every day she had to give some part of herself to survive. She remembered now his words down at Sherrick Hole. He had kept to his word. When I touch, you'll know. It was soon after that episode, under the elms, that she learned that Hal was going to be moved to the neighbouring Fitzroy farm. It was Molly who had informed her with a knowing look on her face, and it was Mrs Burns who uncharacteristically put her arms around her shoulders one day and told her that she would be safe. She still remembered her unusual words. There will be respect now, Miss Bell. Your master insists. She did not hear another word on the matter, neither from her master or Lady Betty, whom she had assumed must have been given details by Molly or Mrs. Burns on the direct evidence from Molly. But she did remember now that she could not look her master or Lady Betty in the eye that night or for some time after. They must have read her letter. Was that the way they knew everything? Kept an eye and an ear on her, always. Miss Bell. <laughs> that was the only time she remembered ever being called so politely. She was told that the new herdsman would be a Mr. Edwards, who lived with his wife and children in a cottage on the edge of the park. The terror of Hal had worked its poison and had never left her, still at times in the midst of the love her husband made with her was the image of that boy and his dirty business. Bell, a pretty name for dirty work, her mother's voice was on her shoulder, reminding her. I'll stop there for the moment. Thank you for that reading, Lawrence, and for, for battling with your headphones to bring I'm it to Sorry us. about that. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. I um, I was telling Lawrence just before we went live that for me, it has been a profoundly meaningful journey of not only reading his books across the years, but from a certain point, getting able, being able to speak about them with him, which I think might have begun with light falling on bamboo and has certainly continued ever since. And perhaps thinking of the parallel between light falling on bamboo, which was published several years ago, and Dangerous Freedom might be a good place to start because light falling on bamboo, for those of you who don't know, concerns itself with the life of a very well-known 19th century painter from Trinidad, Michel Jean Casabon. And while much was known of Casabon's art, far less was known about Casabon, the man and the person. And it seems to me, Lawrence, that one thing you've always done astonishingly well is to take people from history who we either feel we know very well or not so well at all and to really illuminate them. So just as Casabon came to you, what was the impetus for Dido Bell coming to you and saying, here, write about me? Well, Dido has been in my mind quite a long time. I was just writing something at the moment, and it was back in 1995 when I was researching Aylred Sin that I went up to Kenwood House uh, as a great house and wondered about its connection with the slave trade. Because as you know, probably, that um, Aylred Sin, the monastery in Aylred Sin, 
is built on the site of a great house which had history with Antigua and plantations in Antigua. And there is a slave narrative in Aylred Sin. So I was researching Aylred Sin at the time. And there's a portrait in Aylred Sin, the portrait of the sixth Duke of Somerset, um, which is a very different portrait to the portrait of the famous portrait of Dido Bell and her cousin Elizabeth Murray. Um, so she's been around a long time and she exists in a poem of mine called English Heritage, which is about a visit to Kenwood. And this yellow woman, this mulatto woman is staring from the window. So, and Kenwood is very near to where I live. Um, so it's grounds, it's parks, the house itself is something I know very well. So I have been for a long time interested in this new world woman that's her history, her mother, um, and her coming there. I mean, in a sense, I came to England and went into a great house as well, not at all with the background of Dido. But um, a lot of my personal things about coming as a, a stranger to England, I think, has helped me to enter um, Dido. And like Casabon, um, there is nothing that we can read of Dido. Dido hasn't spoken. She has no diaries, no letters. Um, and I wanted to give her a voice. And I wanted to give her a voice where she could speak because I feel those who are speaking on her behalf are slightly romanticizing her life, really, yeah. Isn't it interesting that devoid of any official transcripts or archives, the impulse with, with Dido has been to romanticize her. Certainly the things, the two things that I believe are best known about her now are of course the recent film that was made surrounding her life and of course the famous portraits. And, and from those separate pieces of, of media, a very uh, almost halcyon kind of optimism seems to surround her. And dangerous freedom makes a kind of room to say that her life cannot be so easily summarized by by the optimistic or the hopeful. So I think here it's not at all shying away from the real horrors and degradations and, and actual trauma that she might have very well experienced. Yes, absolutely. Um, I understand the optimism that, in a sense, both members of the, of the black community as well as the white community in England want to have about Dido. I see a television program where Amara Santi, the director of the film, the film incidentally is a film, I, I was two drafts into my novel when the film came out. So I was a pretty scared and I went to see it eventually because I had been keeping away from anything um, about Dido's life that had been created before. Um, and I like the film. I like the film. It's, it, it's, it's beautifully directed and filmed. And, but to me, it is a very, as you say, halcyon, very um, optimistic. In a, Amara Santi says when she first saw the portrait, there she is in all her glory. Well, I want to ask Amazani, what is the glory that she is seeing? Because it's a very conflicted portrait, and uh, I think. And I'm going to be giving a lecture about it in January at Kenwood. Um, and I think there is need for redress. There is need for redress um, with about Dido, both because of the portrait and the film, I mean, I understand what Ama Asante was doing, but it only takes a very particular segment of her life. And I was very interested in her very early life as a child, her life with her mother, whom we don't hear about, who I began to learn about when I first started my research. And also, when she's alone, after Elizabeth Murray, the other person in the painting, her cousin leaves and gets married. Dido is at Kenwood for about nearly 10 years, looking after Lord, dying Lord Mansfield. It's not a romantic time. She's living with three elderly people. 
and she doesn't get married until Mansfield dies. And so there's a whole life there, which I felt, we don't know this. We don't know this person. And I, I really want to, to let her speak and let her have her whole life. And she had such a short life after Kenwood, really, with her children and her husband. Yeah. It's, I was particularly pleased that in the excerpt you chose to read, you have Dido's mother's voice coming in to mention that Belle, Belle as a, a suffix, as a title, is not, is not, and certainly was not for her mother, the beautiful thing that we imagine it to be. I mean, throughout reading Dangerous Freedom, I was very struck by how much women, and in this case, black women, during the the immediacy and immediate aftermath of the slave trade had to suffer sexually and the more so because of their perceived beauty. And I don't think the novel is necessarily making a case for the fact that as existed between Dido's mother and father in Dangerous Freedom, romance, a romantic attachment, ever really made it more excusable, that sense of atrocity. So I'd, I'd love to know what thoughts you had around the creation of the bond between John Lindsay, Dido's father, and her mother, and it, in all its complexity. Yes, and it's very, very complex. And in a sense, I don't give him a lot of room after a certain point in the book. Um, but I will say, and it's interesting, just for a moment, what you said about Belle, it was actually when I was having a discussion with Bridget Barrington, the historian, um, that she has said to me that I had got Augusta, the, the young woman um, out at, on the sugarcane estate um, with a plant, powerful planter there, that she was the belle of the house. And it was well known that the, often the mulatto woman, but not only, sometimes the black woman, who was the mistress of the master of the house would would and be there also for the favors of his friends would be called the bell, and this idea that Maria Bell, um, Dido's mother, and her name Bell, it's it's a problematic name, and it's a slave name. You know, the Dido, the classical name often given to slaves, and then the bell. So her her her, her very name is a is it's a con is a conflicted story. Now about John Lindsay and Maria Bell, and um, yes, and Maria Bell, it seemed to me there were deep ironies um, as a young man viewing a woman. And there are lots of different kinds of stories about how he probably met her. I have him meeting her on the auction block. And she, as someone said to me, she wants to get saved. And the way she is going to be saved is to go for this man and you know and he is handsome and it sounds perverse that he would find her well more perverse that he she finds him um a romantic figure at that moment and he finds her as he is forced to poke her as a piece of merchandise for the slaver finds her somebody to share his life and of course he doesn't share her life completely over the years and what is built into that actually is that John Lindsay, the historical figure, um, is a very romantic figure. You know, he joined the Navy as a schoolboy, as they often did. And I've learned now, you know, he went on to have five, I think four or five illegitimate children, all with black women or mulatto women, as the term was then, and has quite an association with Jamaica. And some of the children you can discover through their, their baptismal um, certificates um, in Jamaica. So there is a background to John Lindsay, but I, to me, he disappears really for, for being a father. He's not being a father. He, he didn't, didn't give any of his children his name. He had children. He was a romantic, I think. Um, in many, many ways. And that is what he remains, yes, yeah. You know what's 
one fascinating thing that's come up for us in this season of bios and bookmarks is the issue of the the hue and shade of of black caribbean skin and what that means throughout different points in history for your life for your legacy and for your survival and we talked about this with shara mccallum in her latest book of poems no ruined stone as well as with Maisie Card's book, These Ghosts Are Family, that the issue that is not or was not just an issue of being black or of being mixed, but that the actual shade and color that you were influenced the kind of role that you could reasonably occupy in society. And this to me certainly seems to be the case for Dido. Hmm. There's a wonderful line in Amar Sante's film where one of the suitors, she has these suitors coming to view not only Dido, but Elizabeth Murray as well for marriage. And one of the young suitors says to the other, now there is one pointing at Dido whom you could, um, you should choose. And he says, no, she's just good for a rollick in a cornfield. Um, and that is there. And it, it's something that's going on in the portrait as well, I think, that she is extraordinarily exoticized, sexualized, and um, why Elizabeth Murray isn't um, the white woman. Um, and I think that is something, as you say, throughout history, it has played a big part in the, in the role that black women have had to play, have been forced to play, have chosen to play maybe sometimes. Um, and we know it well. I mean, just growing up in Trinidad, we know the whole thing about skin color, just like we know the whole thing about um, hair, <laughs> good hair and bad hair and this sort of thing. Uh, certainly as a child of the 40s and 50s, that was something um, I became aware of just listening to black women around me. Um, and that is there, you know, Lady Betty, Lord Mansfield's wife, is constantly telling Dido, certainly at certain times, you know, you need to put that hair away. You know, and I have that in in Witch Broom, where the madam is telling her, "Put that hair under a cap." You know, and this woman, um, Michaela, I've forgotten her surname for a moment, has done a new portrait of Dido, which has been at Kenwood. Um, a number of black artists are being asked to do portraits of um, black personages in great houses, and she said, "I, I don't. I hope I'm not quoting her wrongly." But she says that turban that Dido is wearing is to hide her hair, the, you know, and she has tried to give her a more authentic African sort of headpiece, headcloth. Um, yes, I mean, I, I tread carefully in this whole area, I suppose. I, 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 I don't think I should tread carefully because I feel it's my world, you know. I grew up in Trinidad. I grew up with a lot of black women looking after me and in my mother's house around me. And then of course, later on friends. And because Margaret Busby asked me, I remember the launch of my book on Zoom, how was I getting to all this stuff to get into? And, you know, I came across a Toni Morrison quote really that the writer, the, 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 what the writer has to do is to um, make the familiar strange and make the strange familiar. And it's through, as you said earlier in your little introduction, it's the power of the imagination, really, that has to work. It's not the facts and figures and the dates that I am concerned about as a historian, historical novelist, if that's what I am. But it's actually the imagined figure that I'm interested in, the imagined figure. And I have to pull out all this stuff for myself. Toni Morrison has a wonderful essay called The Sight of Memory, which she says that memoir and fiction have a kind of symbiotic relationship. Um, and look at what she had to do with um, Margaret. Is it Margaret Garner, the woman who killed her child? Um, you know, she, she does more than just tell that story. Beloved is more. Beloved gets to a truth. And I suppose that's what I'm trying to do with da Dangerous Freedom, get to a truth of Daidu, even though I might have to alter history slightly or play with it a bit. Yeah, yeah. 
So for those sure. of us who are, yeah, that, that is a, a perfect answer. And for those of us just joining, welcome again to, to Bios and Bookmarks, powered by the NGC Boca Slit Fest. And Lawrence, you'll be pleased to know that several of your friends and fans are in the chat. A lovely comment from June Amming, who says, so wonderful to see and listen to Lawrence Scott again. Enjoy his work so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> And, and we spoke about, we've spoken a little about the legacy of Kenwood House. And, and it occurs to me that houses, mansions, great estates, um, princely piles and, and humble dwellings, all of these are significant in dangerous freedom from the sort of sequestered rooms, for example, that John Lindsay finds for Maria early on on their arrival to London, to, of course, Kenwood House itself, to the house that Dido or Elizabeth will occupy with John, her husband, and their three sons. You really centralize the importance of the house and what a home means to, to Dido at different points in her life, both when she feels extremely unwelcome and then when she feels that, yes, this finally is her domain. So there's a specific kind of thinking or research or, or pondering go into the ways in which you formulated the domestic sphere in dangerous freedom. It's very interesting you asked me that question because there's something I can really tell you about that. Of course, Kenwood is given to me by history, the very the house where she was placed for her freedom in a way, ironically. Um, and there's Bloomsbury House, where she lives in town. And then the different houses in Deptford and Greenwich, where her mother is put, hidden away, almost. Um, yes. And then, you know, I was I was, when I was researching um, the Georgian house and what kind of house um, Dido and John Davinier would have, because, of course, John de Vigne is a kind of top servant, a steward. Um, he's not the radical lawyer that Amar Santi has um, Dido coupling with in the film. That, I have to say, would not have happened um, in the social um, hierarchy of the 18th century. Um, but one of the things I discovered, I really liked it. And actually, the chapter where she first hears about the house is apparently... The, the buying of a house by an 18th century man of, for his wife to come and live with him was a kind of love letter to say, this is where we're going to be. And um, while Dido, in the book, while Dido is reading to Lord Mansfield about death from Cicero, um, she has in her pocket a letter from John de Vigne telling her that he has found a house. Um, and yes, absolutely. And that's what I wanted. I really wanted to take that Dido out of that frame of that portrait and put her in her home in Ranley Street with her three children, Lydia, who comes with her from Kenwood, Lydia's um, brother, and have them live as ordinary family and her three children, oh, and then one dies. And, you know, her terror that they might be, but be captured. Um, yes, the house... I mean, what a wonderful thing for her to have. And yes, ironically, she's able to have that house because of the, some of the Mansfield legacy, Lady Marjorie's legacy, and of course, the salary that um, John de Vigne has himself. Um, but, you know, houses represent a lot, as they, in the way I'm just telling you there. I mean, she would want, that would be her, her freedom would be to have her own home her own home, um, her garden, um, with Johnny, the boy that dies, you know, she's planting the garden with him, the garden for the future. She's, she's knitting the clothes and sewing the linen that are to see these children into the future because, of course, Dido is not well. I mean, Elizabeth is not well, a little perhaps addicted to the laudanum to which he relieves her. Um, and carries her into these states of hallucination almost. Um, yes, I'm glad you bring that up. And of course, other, some of my other books, actually, houses are very, very important. 
um, which room is structured in houses. Eirid is a very interesting house in um, the monastery in which, um, yes, I'm coming, I'm looking forward to coming to the, to the game we're going to play. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, Casabon is all about houses, a lot of houses he paints, um, great houses as well as ordinary houses, yes, yeah. We have a lovely comment from Ramabai Espiné who says, such a wonderful novel, loved it. And I love Light Falling on Bamboo too. It's great to hear you talking so fully about the inside story of making this work. Thank you, Lawrence. And thanks for your acute questions, Shivani. And of course, audience, please, if you have questions or more comments for Lawrence, please feel free to share them and don't let me monopolize them for the entire hour. But let me just thank Ramabai, who I haven't seen for years. I think I last saw her in Germany, actually, uh, at a conference there. Um, yeah, and she writes, of course, also about the Indian community and the sugarcane in which I grew up as well. Um, Yes, well, hello, Ramabai. <laughs> it's nice. I mean, I feel kind of guilty about these things. I don't often go on to these kind of shows myself. I'm terrible at social media. My publishers, um, you know, wish I was more alive on social media, but I mean, here I, think I am. You're doing a formula here I am now. Here so I am. We're gonna, I'm we'll an old man this. now, you know. I'm an old man now. <laughs> We'll show them this bios and bookmarks as proof that you are actually doing a formidable job. And of course, for those of you who don't know Ramabai Espinay's work, I would strongly encourage you yes. to read it. So you can begin with, but certainly not end with, The Swinging Bridge. And so, Lawrence, it, it feels really deliberate to me that you are also showing us different kinds of love in Dangerous Freedom. We have, of course, a love we've spoken of before between John and Maria. We have what feels like a very different sort of love between Dido and her husband, John. And it made me wonder how important it felt to you to make that relationship between Elizabeth and her husband a love relationship, because you certainly could have chosen to take it in another direction. Mm. How, how vital did that feel for you to create that element? Yes, I had choices there because historically, we don't know a great deal about John de Vignier. Um, there are lots of things that come through. Some of them have historical sort of truth about them, others are surmise. And I went with the suggestions that he was French and that he came from the colonies. Mm -hmm. And of course, another whole way the story could have developed would be to have Dido marry a white man which would have been a very different kind of story. Um, I suppose the way I was feeling and thinking was I think she wanted, she needed, she needed some comfort and solace from what she knew. And when she meets him in the Quaker house and recognizes that he's a little like her, and then his whole history as a kind of parallel in a sense um, develops his estrangement from his mother. Um, that is, I think it is this, this common bo um, background and experience that bonds them in love. And that you know, the episode where they have to try and talk to their children about what slavery is and what the slave trade is. Um, now, Having a marry a white man would have been a whole different kind of story to explore. And um, I decided not to go with that. And also I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be a new world story. I wanted it to be a Caribbean story. I, I consider it a kind of Caribbean book, I do. Um, and I didn't want to get mixed up with his, there were enough white people in the story in a way. And I wanted, another black person in the book centrally as well as and have her children and so on um and so that is yes and he is very supportive and he is very loving perhaps slightly idealized some people think he's not as central as um 
some people would have wanted him to be. Maybe that is one of the flaws in the book, um, that he is not enough there. He's a good father and he's a company. I'm, she I'm not com agreeing that it's a flaw, but I'm agreeing well, with everything else. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm saying that because you could always you could always go with that more. You, know, you can go with things more. But it wasn't his story. Mm -hmm. um, there was enough of his story. It is her story. Um, it's taking her, as Shushida Nasta says, it's getting Dido out of that frame that she's been in and giving her the wholeness of her life. A very yeah, important really, love. Sorry, I mean, go ahead. Sorry, uh, just to say that I really appreciate Sushila's blurb for, for Dangerous Freedom. When, when I first read it, what occurred to me very strikingly was the image of the Dido that we're accustomed to seeing in the portrait. If she were able to step down from the actual frame and speak to people and speak to people who, who are of the contemporary time as much as those she was surrounded by in her time, what might she say for herself? Hmm. And you know, Lawrence, what I found extremely anchoring in, this book, in the book is that you also worked so hard to present the history of slavery and the legacies of slavery as they were evolving in that time period alongside Dido's story. We get this so sharply when you bring up the case of James Somerset, the 1781 Zong massacre, and of course, the labors of Granville Sharp. And these things impacted Dido significantly within her household because, of course, of the rulings of Lord Mansfield. I mean, how important was it for you to situate that active history as crucial to the plot of the book? Well, it's, it's just as crucial, really, because I think the sort of redressing that I wanted, the de-romanticizing that I wanted for Dido, I wanted it also for Mansfield. There's a romantic view that Mansfield was a leading abolitionist. Now, he was not. I'm not saying he was a monster. He was a terrible man. I think he was quite a liberal man. I th he actually says that the system of the Atlantic slave trade and slavery, plantation slavery, was odious and that it needed law to make it so, to, to allow it to happen and would need law to stop it. Um, and of course, that's what they tried to do. Of course, what they leave out is, in fact, all the rebellion that goes on on the plantations that brought things to a stop as well. Um, but absolutely, the judgments, Somerset and the Zong case, are crucial to the book as much as Dido and her life. And that is one of the things that struck me very early on, that she would have... I don't think that uh, there's a romantic view that she influenced the, the judgments. Well well not enough because the judgments weren't so fantastically progressive um as people sometimes want to say i but the fact that he had this girl here in his house i think yes would affect things but maybe not to that extent um but the fact that she would hear those stories you know in the opportunities that were given to her sitting with the family after supper um, and I got stuck, you know, I got very stuck with the book for quite a while. I couldn't go anywhere and I don't necessarily want to carry it this too much. You'll understand why I don't want to talk about the letters too much. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's only when I sorted out the problem of the letters and allowed, uh, particularly, I don't mind talking about Dido's letters, um, and allowed Dido to tell her mother the story of the Zong case. Um, that the whole thing opened up and opened up the mother. Because that, of course, is another thing that has to be redressed. She's so left out. And for me, the, the emotional tug in the book, the emotional, you know, right through is, where is my mother? Um, mm. And um, why hasn't she written to me for 28 years? Yeah. I think, I think and that's the other a great point. So Sorry, I go could ahead. Just quick, if I just quickly say, I think there is a love, you know, the kind of a love that Mansfield has for her mm -hmm. and Lady Betty. They didn't have children and they grow to love these two young girls, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that is there. Yeah. I wanted that to be felt a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah I think it, it's a, a good point at which to invite you to do your second reading from Dangerous Freedom for us, Lawrence. Okay. Well, I am going to carry on with that episode, actually, that um, we first read. 
and Dido is wanting to know what has happened to Charles and Billy with Lydia. And just instantly to say, oh, so the love that has grown in this book throughout between Lydia and Di um, Elizabeth, roles reversed. Um, yeah. Black boy for sale. She was following her son now in her imagination, like she had followed James Somerset, the runaway. She imagined Charles trying to escape his catcher by running over the marshes, hiding among the reeds, hunkered down. He must not be put up for sale. The letter to her mother concerning Hal now seemed ironic, reminding her of her time close to capture. It brought her back now to Johnny's disappearance, the soliciting on the streets by that strange gentleman who offered Lydia a good price for her boys. Her anxiety now seemed more than justified, but she would not say, I told you so, to Lydia. She just wanted her husband to return to the house with her sons. She would not blame Lydia. What she was thinking, poor Lydia, at her age, searching on her, her own with Billy. She had not been able to return home, saying that Charles was missing. Elizabeth was not sure, was sure that that was the reason. She had been reminded so repeatedly not to lose any of her boys. It was impossible to concentrate. And then Master's voice seemed to be speaking from his portrait in the hall. I must see to her manumission. Dido's master proclaimed. I cannot have her assaulted or attention drawn to her presence. Only the other day at Highgate, some wretch caught and sent back. So much for my judgment. It was in the Gazette and the new daily advertiser. Did he think to come over the hill to my door for freedom? Poor wretch. No one understands my narrow judgment in the Somerset case. They think I have bestowed freedom on every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the Americas and the West Indies who sets foot here in England because I let the black Somerset go. They are wrong. As I keep saying, a narrow judgment for the good of the realm and his majesty's coffers. Only law can make such a thing so odious, legitimate. Only another law can change it completely. People must be educated by the law. Dido stood at the door of his dressing room and overheard her master talking to Mr. Way. It must be stated in the will, Dido's freedom. Yes, my lord. What had it meant, his law, his manumission, if today her son cannot walk back from school safely? Elizabeth raged within herself, sitting alone with her writing box. Where were the papers, as her mother would say, the manumission? She never received any papers. A statement in a will, was that sufficient? Her husband, did he have those important papers? She began to imagine the worst. If they were not identified by the correct documents, what of their boys? The nonchalance of it. It was the privilege of power in dealing with their property. She fed the robins. The summer heat was at its zenith, and her garden was getting dried out. Mercifully, the heavens had opened the day before, but the hot earth had soaked up the rains. It smelt like Pensacola, rain on hot earth. The dryness had been good for her, breathing. Now there was a chill with the damp. Charles would be so exposed to the weather. Elizabeth had so wanted her mother's protection. She was hungry for it. Who was her real protection? Her husband became that protection. Could he be sure of being able to do so now? They were a household ready for capture. How could they protect themselves when any fraction of Africa's color could get them captured and deported? It had been raining again. The house was silent, but for the drip, drip on the path. The light had faded. Darkness had come. Surely they would return now or without Charles. Her son will be soaked. They had to come and tell her what was happening. The oil lamp in the street was turned on. There would be that light for a while on the street, but not out on the marshes. That was where she imagined they were. 
Elizabeth began to pace up and down in the hall. The Van Loo portrait of her master stared down. Lydia was too old for this search. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Florence. I want to launch right into an intriguing question from Jalaluddin Khan, who first says, thank you for your wonderful discussion. Question to Mr. Scott. Do you have any thoughts regarding telling stories and influencing local, which, by which I take to mean Trinidadian, historical heritage, both tangible and intangible conversation, especially in Trinidad and Tobago? Right. Any thoughts regarding telling his stories and influencing local? Question is that any thoughts regarding telling his stories and influencing local historical heritage? Right. Well, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of thoughts about. Um, in fact, you know, all my. I'm not sure whether I'm answering your question properly, but. All my writing has been, in a sense, um, about finding conversation, if you like, um, about historical, the historical and the local, really. And that local may not be just happening in Trinidad or in the islands, like in this story, the local, you know, it's, it's an interpenetrate, interpenetrating worlds. The slave trade was, you know, the Guinea coast. It was the New World and back. It was the Triangle. Um, in my novel, Witch Broom, it's very in Trinidad, but it's the whole world. The world has come to Trinidad. And so all these historical conversations are, are local, but they are global. Um, and the same with my novel, Aylred Sin, which might seem as not a historical novel, but of course it is a historical novel because it's a, 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 a private story and a brother goes to find out what has happened to his brother. He leaves his Cocoa estate in Trinidad and goes in, in, you know, in the care of, a, of, a, of an Indian overseer and goes to England to find out why his brother has, what was his brother's life and why has he died? and comes up with a whole history in a, found in a great house in England. Um, and it was Alison Donnell, actually, an academic from um, the university in the north, a, the um, East Anglia, who said, isn't it extraordinary that what um, Robert, who is report, telling the story in Aylred Sin, does is he takes back to the Coco estate the the photograph of his brother and his lover um, who of course is a man it's a homosexual love story and so it brings that to the local you know which would be very disturbing because these things at the time the story was disturbing in Trinidad um, so the local conversations are global conversations um, Casabon was an international figure. Um, and here in Dangerous Freedom, where a book that has given me quite a lot of trouble because it's slightly out of my comfort zone in a way, researching a story so English, if you like. A lot of people are saying they like this book and because in England, and it's maybe because it's in England, you know, and they find the Trinidad, the, the stories embedded in Trinidad slightly more difficult. Um, so I'm not sure whether I'm really answering the question, but I have been very concerned with these historical conversations that which are all which are local, but not local in a sort of um, narrow sense. Yeah, I don't know. I hope that's helpful. I, I think so, and thank you for that question, Jalaluddin. We have a lovely comment from. Our book is Fest founder and director, Marina Salandi Brown, who has left the comment <laughs> under the auspices of the book of Fest page, but it is her. And she says, the way Lawrence writes about love relationships has always marked out his writing. Love, which is so hard to write about, is at the core of all his work. Love between all sorts of people, mothers and sons, illicit love, unrequited love. 
He does it with such skill and heart. No PC withholding. He has done it again with this novel. Thank you, Lawrence. Well, I have a lot to thank Marina Salandi Brown for Marina, who I met at a conference in 1993, I think it was, which room had just come out. And she came up in her usual Marina way. I never knew Marina before. She was a voice on the radio and said, this book has to be on the radio, you know. And of course, she produced Witch Broom for um, Book at Bedtime and got Margaret Busby to um, shorten it. What's the word I want? A bridge. <laughs> yes. A bridge. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. So Marina, thanks again. Yes, I do write about love. Yeah. I do, yeah. So we cannot let Lawrence Scott escape us without playing the bios and bookmarks game promptly written. So for those of you who've been with us all season, you'll know how the game goes. But for those of you just joining us, allow me to explain it to you again. The premise is simple. In it, our writer, Lawrence Scott, gets onto an elevator. As he enters the elevator, there are two people inside it having a conversation. And they happen to be Lawrence's dream publisher and editor. And the thing that they're talking about is the very thing Lawrence is going to pitch them a most spectacular idea about. So it's like an elevator pitch for the bios and bookmarks family. And as you know, we tailor each of these specifically to our writers. So without further ado, we're going to first reveal what it is, and then we'll hear Lawrence's answer. So, as you saw, bad company corrupts good character. Lawrence, take it away. What is your pitch? Well, my pitch really is something I desperately want, and I would want my ideal editor and publisher, an agent really, if I could have him in the elevator as well, is to make a film of Aylred Sin. Wow. Um, and I really do want that. And um, bad company um, corrupts good character is interesting. There's a, there's a phrase in um, Aylred Sin, which is never in twos, always in threes. And that is because these, these are kind of injunctions within the religious community, their fear of homosexual love. Um, and, you know, I had a very good friend when I was a boy growing up at Mount St. Benedict. And he told me years after, and I didn't have a sexual relationship with this friend, anything like that. Um, he was just a very good close friend. He was slightly older than me and he was like a bit of a protector. Um, and he said to me at one of the monks one day said to him, you know, this is not, a, this is not good. A bit like, you know, bad company corrupts good character. You know, you mustn't, this is not going to end well. And the whole sort of fear, a terrible fear of homosexual love that existed in the forties and fifties and before, and still does for many, many people and in the church and so on. So while a lot of liberation has been happening, I'm going to say to my editor and my, my publisher and my agent, you know, we have all this liberation around the place. We don't have it within the churches. And we don't, it's not actually there yet in societies so fully as we would want. And um, a film, as Marina says, because, and I've always held that, Aylred Sin is a love story. Um, it's not a treatise on what is the correct PC behavior of people or anything like that. It's a love story. And I, I just deny anyone to read that book um, and not be moved by its humanness, the humanity. I was talking to Al Alexander uh, at the university during Lit, Lit Week this year. And I, I talk about Aylrids in there and I... I make that point. It's the humanness of that story that I would like to see on the big screen. You know, I want to see that. So if you can get this done, this is what you're supposed to be doing as <laughs> publishers and editors and agents. 
get Aridson onto the big screen. Yeah. I, I find that 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 response feels almost serendipitous because one <laughs> thing I did during lockdown uh, this year was to finally read Aridson. It had been on my shelf for years and years and years, but I had not read it. And I was so emotional. You see, I can't even find words. I was so undone and so profoundly moved by it that uh, I've been meaning to write you a long letter about it ever since. So the letter will come and that will be private. <laughs> but let I me look forward at to least it. say in, in front of everyone that it is it's one of the most important books of my life, you know, without reservation. And um, of course, everyone who's looking at this is going to buy and read Dangerous Freedom. But yes. you should also read mm -hmm all of Lawrence's previous books, including Il Red Sin. And... Um, Can I just pop in here quickly and say that it's very much in my mind at the moment, Il Red Sin, because in two years' time, Il Red Sin will be 25 years old. Oh, my goodness. I know. It is extraordinary, isn't it? And... Wow. Right now, I know there are a number of people writing about it, and, um, yeah, I want it to be a film, right? So I'm telling those people in the elevator... Yeah. <laughs> I love that. We um we would usually be wrapping up right about now, but we just have a follow-up question from Jalal Din Khan that I think is really insightful. So I'm gonna squeeze it in if I may. He's saying, What I appreciate about Lawrence Scott's writing is about choices and moral decisions the characters make, and by extension, us. The details of his creation of historical spaces and periods in detail. I wish to ask him. How important is memories versus individual story, individual choices to important? Are his stories about questing choices or to tell us about a world of joined memories? So I suppose that question is about the distinction between how much of a choice we have in telling our stories and how much memory, I suppose, versus how much fact is in any story we tell. Well, that's a wonderful question. And I think I was touching on some of it, actually, when I talked about Toni Morrison's essay, The Sight of Memory. Um, and she argues in that essay, because it was actually uh, an anthology of essays about, the, about memoir writing. And she said, well, you know, I'm a fiction writer, but of course the relationship between fiction and memoir is symbiotic. And yes, I mean, some people say, oh, I see you in this book, I see you in that book, and so on. So I wonder how they see me in Dangerous Freedom and where they see it. Um, but there's a lot of me in Dangerous Freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the bit of memory that um, is there. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it, is, it helps has helped me to enter not only Dido, but the range of characters who are there. To, to give them some truth and to give them some, some depth, some, an interior life that facts and figures and um, just descriptions, um, flat descriptions don't do uh, and give voice, I suppose. That's the big thing. So I think in equal proportion, you know, memory, yeah, Memory is as important. Memory is well. Memory is the, uh, the one of the most important things to the writer, um, and I don't see how you can work without your memory of. Because where are you going to put? I mean, I'm an Earl Lovelace saying this, and I've heard other writers say it as well. Where are you going to pull these characters out of? You can only pull them out of yourself. You know, you have to, and it's what uh, the, the Marina Warner acknowledgement as 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 nice as um, Shushila's is about taking Dido out of the frame, Marina Warner's um, statement about fictive empathy. Where is that empathy going to come from, but within you, into your fiction? Um, so, yeah, memory is, like, fundamental. And Thank you for that, I I'm Lawrence. a fiction, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, I think that is a lovely note on which to end. And, and as we're bringing things to a close, the, the comment section is full of people who are, are seeing a great deal, how much they enjoyed your presence here. You have special greetings from Carolyn Cooper in Jamaica, who says mm. she still remembers yours and Jenny's hospitality in London in the 80s. 
Which is well, I'm very... sitting. I'm sitting in the room where Car- <laughs> Carolyn knows actually, and my study is in a room where she slept apparently as well. <laughs> it's a very personal and, and intimate note to, to bring to a close. What has been a season all about the personal and the intimate? And Lawrence, I couldn't think of a finer guest to to round out our season finale of telling complex family stories. I want to thank you so much for being our final ghost guest. Not ghost. You're not going to make ghost for a very long time. <laughs> not, I hope and not. <laughs> and, and, and when you are, I expect you will write stories there as well. Our final guest for this season. Thank you so much. It's been a, a pleasure as always to speak with you. Well, thank you very much. And I would like to encourage people, as I and Jenny have only shamefully recently done, become friends of Bocas in a quite sort of official sense. I mean, Bocas is very, very important, not just to me, it's important to Trinidad, it's important to the Caribbean, it's important globally. Marina and her team, all of you have done an enormous amount and it has to be supported, yeah. Thank you for that, Lawrence. So as he says, and you heard it from him this time, not me, if you've been a fan of Bocas Lit Fest for our 10 plus year history of programming, and outreach, you will want to join Friends of Focus Lit Fest. You see a little bit about that initiative in the credits. Finally, I want to thank all the writers, editors, and publishers who are part of this season. And there will be a season six of Bios and Bookmarks beginning in November. Until then, everyone, happy reading and please stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.